Our next speaker is Jake Payne. Jake is a Master of Clinical Psychology and a PhD candidate at Swinburne University of Technology. His recent paper, Combining Psychedelic and Mindfulness Interventions, Synergies to Inform Clinical Practice, uh, ACS Pharmacology and Translational Science. Jake is also on Twitter. So if you are on Twitter, uh, both Chris and Jake are there. You can keep those conversations going there. Uh, this is Jake Payne. Hey everyone, I'm excited to be here to speak with you. Thank you to Entheogenesis Australia for having me. I'm Jake Payne. I'm in my first year of a Master's of Clinical Psychology and PhD program at Swinburne University. Before I started my clinical PhD, I completed my honours in psychology at Monash where I studied the neuroscience of attention and experienced mindfulness meditators. I then worked as a research officer at the non-profit mindfulness meditation company, Smiling Mind. Today, I'll be speaking about a topic I'm interested in both personally and academically, so much so that I wrote a prospective paper about it before starting my PhD. I believe mindfulness, the ability to step back and observe your current experience without judgment, but with acceptance, is a very useful tool for many aspects of our society today. And similarly, Psychedelic substances, when used in psychotherapeutic settings, appear to have the potential to help those from suffering from mental health disorders. The paper I wrote is titled Combining Psychedelic and Mindfulness Interventions, Synergies to Inform Clinical Practice, published in the American Chemical Society's Pharmacology and Translational Science. It's about particular ways mindfulness and psychedelic-based interventions may be, may be used together to overcome the limitations of the other. A big shout-out to the co-authors of the paper. My friend and mentor, Dr. Richard Chambers, who is a mindfulness educator at Monash University, and Dr. Paul Lignatsky, who is a friend of entheogenesis and is leading a number of the first clinical psychedelic trials across Australia. I'm going to begin my talk by outlining a brief history of the idea of combining psychedelic and meditation practices. I will then give an overview of what psychedelic and mindfulness interventions are. Then I will go into the detail of the paper. And finally, I will end by going through some important considerations and limitations of the ideas presented. So, a bit about the history of psychedelics and meditation. The idea of combining psychedelics and meditation is not new. Many discussions have been had about how the two should be used together, notably from people like Richard Alpert, aka Ramdas, and the neuroscientist Sam Harris. A common metaphor used to describe the relationship between psychedelics and meditation is that psychedelic experiences are like a helicopter that takes you directly to the top of a mountain, which is like the end goal of meditation practice. Whereas meditation is more like a gradual ascent up to the mountain, requiring continuous effort and consistency of practice. For a great account of different Buddhist meditation teachers' perspective about the subject, I would recommend reading a book called Zig Zag Zen, Buddhism and Psychedelics by Alan Badana. It's an interesting question to me how far the connection between Buddhism and psychedelics goes. Books such as The Secret Drugs of Buddhism by Michael Crowley argues that psychedelics played a central role in early Hinduism, which came before Buddhism, and even that the rings behind the head of many Buddhas depict that of a spore print of a mushroom. Many people are sceptical about this, and feel this is a stretch. I'm agnostic, however. Many close friends I know report experiencing insights while under psychedelics that appear to resemble the teachings of Buddhism, and I've heard many stories of people getting into meditation after their psychedelic experience. So there seems to be something there. You may have personally experienced it or heard anecdotes of individuals having an experience with psychedelics and then starting to get what meditation is about and feel drawn towards following a more spiritual or contemplative path. So, moving on to the current research into psychedelics. As you probably know, we are in the midst of a resurgence of interest in the psychotherapeutic potential of psychedelic substances like psilocybin, LSD and DMT in combination with psychotherapy for the treatment of mental illness. A psychedelic renaissance, some say. Recent 
research indicates that even relatively short-term psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy can safely produce rapid and sustained clinical benefits for those with depression, alcohol, and other substance addiction, as well as those with existential anxiety in those who have terminal cancer. During high-dose psychedelic sessions, many participants report a peak state referred to as a mystical, connective, or unitive experience, which are commonly described as devoid of space and time, where there is a dramatic reduction in the distinction between self and non-self. These experiences often feel insightful, and as if new knowledge or perspectives are acquired, but they are often very hard to describe in language. Research shows that the magnitude of these experiences during acute psychedelic dosing is a key predictor of sustained positive changes in psychological functioning. Interestingly, many people report their psychedelic experiences as both very challenging, yet also among the most personally meaningful experience in their lives, alongside moments like the birth of their first child or the first time that they fell in love. Much more research is needed to understand the effects of psychedelic-assisted psychotherapy. Questions I'm particularly interested in include who it's effective for, which forms of psychotherapy should it be paired with, and how these experiences influence adult psychological developmental processes. I'll now move from talking about psychedelic interventions to mindfulness meditation and mindfulness-based interventions. Mindfulness meditation is a broad term to describe practices that involve sitting with eyes closed, attending to specific aspects, for example, breath, bodily sensations, or non-specific aspects, for example, whatever emerges in the present moment, without judgment. The term mindfulness has been used to refer to a state of awareness, a psychological trait, and a mental activity, resulting in some confusion among researchers. Researchers still debate about how to define and operationalize mindfulness. What we call mindfulness meditation today originally developed within Buddhism to alleviate mental suffering. It has been now incorporated into psychological interventions such as mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, and acceptance and commitment therapy, which are particularly effective in reducing symptoms of depression, pain, and addiction. Depending on the tradition, whether it's spiritual, religious, or secular, mindfulness practice explicitly or implicitly aims to create some kind of lasting personality trait change in the practitioner such as improved concentration, relaxation, awareness of emotions, self-transcendence, or spiritual enlightenment. Mindfulness meditation typically requires regular practice to receive the most benefit, and while it is simple in theory and the way it's presented, it can be difficult to begin and maintain a consistent practice. Similar to psychedelics, much more research is needed into mindfulness, Some questions include how much practice, i.e. days per week, minutes per session, is required to receive benefit? Who is it it more effective for? Which context is mindfulness practice particularly effective in? Luckily, a lot of great work is being done at the University of Melbourne's Contemplative Studies by Nicholas Van Dam, as well as Monash University's Centre for Consciousness and Contemplative Studies by Jakob Howey, Craig Hassard and Richard Chambers. This is thanks to the generous donations of Martin Hosking to both centres. I'll now outline the research that has combined psychedelics and mindfulness. Some preliminary evidence shows interesting possibly positive synergistic links between mindfulness and psychedelics. For example, multiple studies have found the administration of psychedelics to increase both state and trait mindfulness. There has been two seminal papers demonstrating the synergistic relationship between psychedelics and mindfulness. The first one comes from a group from the Netherlands. Smigielski and colleagues in 2019 found that psilocybin administered to experienced mindfulness practitioners during a five-day meditation retreat was associated with increased meditation depth, higher post-intervention trait mindfulness, and improved psychosocial functioning at four months follow-up compared to a placebo condition. They also found that compared to non-meditators receiving the same dose of psilocybin in another study, mindfulness practitioners reported more mystical type experience and lower anxiety during the psychedelic experience. 
The other seminal paper is by Roland Griffiths and colleagues from Johns Hopkins in 2018, who found that administering psilocybin to healthy participants alongside supported spiritual practice, which included some mindfulness training, led to greater improvements across many key outcomes, including positive mood and attitudes as well as life satisfaction at six-month follow-up compared to active placebo. They found that more intensive spiritual training was associated with greater increases in acute mystical type experiences during psilocybin dosing, as well as more personally profound meditation experiences, increased positive behaviours and meaning in life at six months follow-up. Taken together, these findings suggest that psychedelics may increase meditation depth and dispositional mindfulness, and mindfulness meditation practice might reduce anxiety during psychedelic experiences and increase the likelihood of inducing a mystical type experience, which is important for therapeutic outcomes. Now to the unique contribution of this paper, which is the focus of this talk. Previous research has focused on how psychedelics and mindfulness are similar. In this perspective paper, we focused on potential clinically relevant useful differences between psychedelic and mindfulness interventions that might address common challenges within the other intervention. We used an overarching metaphor, a compass and a vehicle. Here you can see an illustration of this metaphor. Psychedelic treatments may serve the role of a compass, initiating, motivating and steering the course of mindfulness practice while mindfulness-based interventions may serve the role of a vehicle, integrating, deepening, generalizing, and maintaining the novel perspectives and motivation instigated by a psychedelic experience. The paper outlines six key synergies, i.e. ways the two can produce a combined effect greater than the sum of their separate effects between psychedelic and mindfulness interventions that could inform clinical practice. I'll now go through each one of them. The first synergy we discussed in the paper is mindful state recognition. When beginning to practice mindfulness meditation, it can be challenging for novice meditators to know the specific target mental processes that reflect progress along a path of advancing one's practice. While skillful mindfulness teachers and clinicians attempt to guide individuals to desired states, individuals must rely on their own subjective experience to ascertain the effectiveness of their approach. This can lead to confusion and potentially reduce motivation to practice. Interestingly, as I mentioned before, psychedelics have been found to increase facets of trait mindfulness, particularly heightened present moment awareness, increased ability to articulate momentary experience, and the capacities of non-judgment and non-reactivity. Psychedelics also produce states sometimes associated with prolonged meditation, such as decreased self-referential thinking, feelings of interpersonal connectedness, and non-dual experience. Thus, psychedelic experiences may provide a reliable, albeit transient, subjective experience that appears to substantially overlap with meditative states, which typically require considerable practice to achieve. These psychedelic experiences may better orient mindfulness practitioners toward these states in their ongoing daily meditation practice. Now to synergy number two, motivation for mindfulness practice. Practicing mindfulness can be challenging and without rapid benefits. Many can feel demotivated and stop practicing, which means they won't receive any potential benefits. We hypothesize that the afterglow of a psychedelic experience which is the extended period of experiencing the positive effects following psychedelics, might resemble aspects of deep meditative states and the effects of prolonged meditation practice. Thus, psychedelics may motivate people to initiate or sustain mindfulness practice over time. Experiencing the benefits firsthand is important, as research indicates that awareness of the potential benefits of meditation is associated with and may predict sustained meditation practice. Now to synergy number three, depth of mindfulness. During mindfulness practice, practitioners commonly encounter challenging thoughts and emotions, for example, repressed memories, that can trigger psychological defenses and experiential avoidance. This could potentially cause people to stop practicing and thus limit beneficial effects. 
It can often be hard to get past initial hindrances and defences to reach a greater depth of practice, which involves deeper personal and transpersonal qualities. Psychedelics may address reactive barriers to achieving meditation depth through transiently and potently lowering psychological defences, provoking insights and new perspectives, and compelling the individual to face their fears, repress memories or insights. So, psychedelics may calibrate the individual to an attitude of less defensiveness and greater openness, allowing them to better navigate difficult experiences that arrive through deep states of meditation, and to continually deepen their practice through mindful attention and curiosity. Such transient psychedelic experiences may thereby improve both the quality of the meditative state and potentially its long-term benefits. Now to synergy number four. Mindful compassion. Mindfulness without kindness and self-compassion can take on a cold, critical quality that can paradoxically lead to maladaptive emotional regulation strategies such as repression. Compassion appears to enhance the capacity to approach and process difficult emotions instead of avoiding them and is an important part of practicing mindfulness. However, people learning mindfulness can find it difficult to cultivate and maintain compassion for oneself and others due to patterns of self-critical rumination, feelings of unworthiness, insecure attachment styles, difficulty processing strong emotions, and resistance. Psychedelics have been found to increase self-compassion and emotional empathy. Therefore, psychedelics may instigate a more compassionate type of mindfulness practice, potentially enhancing its therapeutic utility. Now to synergy number five, psychedelic non-avoidance. During a psychedelic experience, the common barrage of substantial phenomenological, cognitive, affective, and perceptual changes can trigger confusion and distress. Psychologically challenging experiences are common, and if they are not resolved, may be harmful or at least reduce the potential benefit of the experience. It appears that those who can work through such experiences during the effects are more likely to receive the therapeutic benefit. A key factor differentiating from beneficial from counterproductive psychedelic experiences is whether the participant is open to and accepting of the experience, or whether they resist it. While preparatory sessions for psychedelics often include discussion of the importance of maintaining a non-avoidant attitude, during the dosing session, this can be challenging for many people when they are actually confronted by this material during the acute effects. As mindfulness practice aims to reduce experiential avoidance, practicing mindfulness before and during dosing session may assist in lowering negative reactivity and avoidant responding, thereby decreasing the chance of a therapeutically ineffective or even harmful bad trip. Thus, it could be beneficial to train in non-avoidance prior to a psychedelic experience. And lastly, to synergy number six, sustained psychedelic proximity and generalization. Psychedelic experiences can often have a period of afterglow, which I mentioned before. However, these tend to dissipate over a period of days or weeks. People feel great during the afterglow and can have strong resolve But this doesn't always last. Given that, as I've mentioned, how intensive and extensive mindfulness meditation induces states that resemble mystical type experiences had under the effect of psychedelics, which are important for therapeutic benefit, learning to practice mindfulness meditation after psychedelic therapy may help maintain experiential proximity to the psychedelic encounter, which may in turn help to maintain clinical effects. Psychedelic experiences within modern clinical trials are rated among life's most personally meaningful and profound experiences by a large majority of participants, with participants reporting dramatic alterations in their beliefs, affect, and motivation to change. However, the gradual relapse of symptoms in many patients and the risks of spiritual bypassing, a tendency to use peak or transcendent experiences to facing unresolved psychological issues, and developmental issues suggest that it may be important to frequently ground and generalize and apply these personally profound experiences within daily life. Mindfulness practice may provide the bridge between the psychedelic experience and day-to-day life, thereby aiding in the integration and generalization of insights 
into relationships, attitudes, affect, and behaviours, and reducing the resumption of maladaptive habits. So that was the last synergy of the paper. In the paper, we went on and proposed a set of research hypotheses that could be used to test particular ways in which mindfulness and psychedelics might fruitfully be combined, including scales and other tools that could be employed to explore these. I won't go through them here, but you can view them in the paper if you're interested. So, because this was a perspective paper, there was no limitation section. However, in my opinion, there are some limitations of the paper and things to think about. First, our paper was speculative, as it was very much based on preliminary research and camp common anecdotes. Much more research is required. Also, we described only some potential synergies between psychedelics and mindfulness. There could be many more. For example, we focused mainly on the relationship between mindfulness and high-dose psychedelic experiences, whereas I, I think there's potential for low doses to augment meditation practice and also a role for therapists administering psychedelics to clients to learn to practice mindfulness to better deliver psychedelic therapy. There could also be dissynergies in between psychedelics and mindfulness that weren't discussed. For example, I think that there could be potential for psychedelics to disrupt attentional capa capabilities required for practicing mindfulness. All the mental phenomena happening during psychedelic experiences may make it difficult to concentrate while practicing mindfulness. While possible, this is speculative and no research has confirmed or disconfirmed this hypothesis. Another potential dissynergy is that after a psychedelic experience, one may be motivated to practice mindfulness mainly in order to recreate the, psychedelic ex the peak psychedelic experience. Some may consider this goal-oriented motivation antithetical to the notion of non-striving and acceptance of the moment, which is a core tenet of mindfulness. However, it's unknown whether the potential benefit of the experience for guiding one's mindfulness practice is outweighed by the risk of the experience leading to disruptive striving. So again, more research is required. There was also an assumption in the paper about the similarities of psychedelic and meditative states. While states of deep meditation and high doses, high dose psychedelics appeared to resemble each other, in the paper we assumed a lot about their similarity. More research is needed to understand how they're similar and how they're different. Now there all might have been some you know, cultural concerns um, that could have come up from the paper. For example, in some mindfulness traditions, ideas about purity and not using mind-altering substances are valued, and so combining the two might be going against this. Similarly, many may be offended and reject the idea that psychedelics are a shortcut or a window into the effects of a long-term mindfulness practice, and think that psychedelics have no place in meditation practice. This view seems to contrast many anecdotes of individuals first getting into meditation after psychedelic experiences. I think there is you know, some kind of functional role psychedelics could play in one's meditation practice. However, again, more research is needed to understand the role of psychedelics in augmenting mindfulness meditation practice. And last, it's really important to stress that while we suggested these synergies might inform clinical practice, to date, all studies researching the overlap between mindfulness and psychedelics has been with healthy populations. There may be unforeseen and specific complications of using these practices among clinical populations. So I advise close supervision from experienced mindfulness practitioners and mental health professionals if combining the two. This may also be a limitation of the paper, in that while the paper intended to inform clinical practice, it was mainly informed by healthy populations and this might not translate so clearly into clinical practice. And I think it's, it's just really important to say in general that I don't think psychedelics or mindfulness are for everyone, and combining them still does not make them a panacea. Rather, they are tools that might help and appeal to some people in particular situations. In conclusion, our paper argued that there is a synergistic potential for psychedelic and mindfulness interventions to be combined for overcoming the limitations of the other and hopefully for improving clinical outcomes. My hope is that this paper will spur discourse about this topic and encourage future research in this area. I'm aware of a few ongoing studies in this area 
and I look forward to seeing if the hypotheses outlined in our paper will hold up. Shout out to some researchers in this area. There is great work being done on this topic by Marco Schlosser from the University of Geneva, Otto Simonsen at the University of Oxford, and my friend Devin Stolicker at Monash University here in Melbourne. I'd like to thank and acknowledge my co-authors on the paper again. Richard and Paul are both pioneers in mindfulness and psychedelic research in Australia, respectively. Working them with them was a privilege and a valuable experience for me. And I'd also like to mention an exciting research group I'm part of, the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium, or the EPRC. The EPRC is a multidisciplinary collective of researchers and practitioners aiming to study and categorize the mystical or spiritual emergent phenomena that arise during psychedelics, meditation, and related practices. The EPRC hopes to generate clinically relevant information that can add value to practitioners, patients, clinicians, and healthcare systems. If you want to support the EPRC, you can head to the EPRC website. Just type Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium into Google. Finally, I'd like to thank you for your attention and to thank Entheogenesis for having me. If you want to keep up to date with my work, you can follow me on Twitter at jakepain 92 Thank you very much. And Jake Payne, thank you very much for your talk. And now you're here for our Q&A session. If you do have any questions for Jake, drop them into the YouTube uh, comment section. And as I mentioned earlier, Jake is also on Twitter if you want to contact him there. Uh, but our first question for you, Jake, is what advice would you give to someone thinking about taking a psychedelic and meditating at the same time? Hmm. Yeah, that's, thanks for the question, Nick. That's, a, that's an interesting one um, because while I'm not, wouldn't be trying to advocate for anyone to take psychedelics. Um, but if they were going to anyway, I would definitely tell them to, you know, have a think about you know, what, what their motivation is for doing it, what they are hoping to get out of doing it. Um, I, I'd encourage anyone to, you know, set up a, a some kind of a ritual where there's, you know, incense, a, you know, nice cushion, nice environment, um, and just, yeah, really allow it to be a, an opportunity to go inside oneself and you know, think about the nature of themselves. Um, but also yeah, don't get too carried away with it and just retain a, a sense of um, skepticism about their experience afterwards. Um, if you have a question, please do drop it in. Is there anything that you wanted to add um, that maybe uh, you felt like you uh, thought of later for the presentation, Jake? I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I'm doing in my PhD at the moment. So at the moment at Swinburne, I'm studying the effect of significant psychedelic experiences or your know, meaningful psychedelic experiences, which alter people's sense of self and how, how that influences secular adult development. So I'm interested in how these kind of experiences that people call meaningful, that seem to you know, change their lives in important ways, can you know, accelerate, deepen, or alter how um, people, you know, commit certain like developmental processes and stages in life, and how it affects career direct, direct you know, trajectories and yeah, their their ambition in life. I'm quite interested in that. And we do have another question now uh, of the testable research questions you list in the paper. Uh, which do you think is the most important to answer, and why is that one the one? Yeah. I'm really interested in, yeah, like taking a group of people who haven't meditated before and, you know, giving, you know, half of them psychedelics, uh, you know, a high-dose psychedelic experience and the other half no psychedelics and seeing what happens over time and seeing, um, yeah, d does do, do those people that have the psychedelic experience, are they more drawn to practice? Do they, do they practice more than those who don't? Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention that at the moment at Monash, they're recruiting for um, a study that's going to be training people in meditation before to psych before psychedelics. So um, yeah, I'll just um, I'll drop that in, in that link for that if anyone wants to get involved in that study because they are looking for healthy populations. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the kind of meditation that you practice yourself in your uh, personal life? Yeah, so the practice that I do at the moment, I'd call it self-inquiry meditation. It's very much about, you know, looking at 
questioning, you know, what is aware in this present moment and, you know, noticing where my mind goes and then if it wanders off, just coming back to the kind of question of what is what is noticing this experience. Um, it's kind of mainly the philosophy of the teacher I'd go by is a, a guy called Adyashanti. Uh, what do you think are the biggest uh, challenges facing Australian psychedelic research at the moment? Mm, yeah, good question. I think that the biggest challenge is going to be yeah, that how it goes from translating from research trials and it, how it comes into the clinic. I think learning how to, you know, what kind of training requirements should someone have before they can give someone else psychedelics. Um, I think there's a lot of risk around people, um, practitioners imposing their own beliefs onto um, vulnerable patients um, because, as Chris has kind of mentioned, they do have potential to alter people's metaphysical beliefs and. I think if it's their beliefs aren't kind of grounded in some kind of natural belief, they might become susceptible to, you know, conspiracy theories, new age thinking, um, which I think as we've seen, yeah, there's not that much data at the moment to really show that there is this link, this kind of opening from having psychedelics to believing in conspiracies. But I, I suspect there is something there. Um, so I'm a bit worried about how that's going to happen particularly after seeing what's gone on during COVID and the kind of ramping up of conspiracy theories. Something that I'm sure a lot of us have um, noticed just anecdotally, um, uh, as I mentioned at the start of tonight's broadcast, I, I spent a lot of my early psychedelic community days uh, online and I feel like the online spaces, a lot of the forums have become a lot more uh, hostile and a lot more aggressive with their uh, uh, pushing of some pretty uh, far out uh, beliefs, far out. Uh, Dr. Martin yeah, Williams I'm, asking meditation. Oh, sorry. I, I was just saying like, yeah, like I, you know, I didn't really understand the kind of epistemic risks that kind of Chris, Chris had mentioned in his talks before, but I really see how um, COVID really kind of shows where the rubber hits the road and where there is some kind of consensus reality that is really important that we need to care about it. I don't think it's, yeah, I think it's dangerous to allow people to have their own, you know, true their own truths. I think that is a consensus reality. Uh, Martin Williams asking: uh, Meditation seems to be regarded as more of a long-term practice, while uh, psychedelics are sometimes criticised as being a quick ride to the summit. Uh, can these uh, impressions be reconciled? Mm. So, yeah, look. Like I, people talk about, you know, psychedelic practice and taking psychedelics, you know, regularly or in small amounts to kind of, you know, maintain the states they like to achieve through meditation. I think that's possible, but I just don't think it's um, feasible to take psychedelics. And eventually, yeah, I think it's there's a risk that someone might become reliant on taking psychedelics instead of yeah, doing meditation, if, if it's going to get them to the same place, it's probably better for their body um, not to take psychedelics all the time. Uh, another question, this one from Shana, who's curious about the relationship between trauma and body scanning, the safety of the experience and readiness for consciousness exploration. Uh, should the trauma healing come first? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. And there is a lot of more talk about trauma-informed mindfulness. Um, but it's still risky business, you know, like when we're talking about bringing mindfulness into schools, um, into the workplace, there's, yeah, like, you know, sometimes you might not know if you have trauma and you, and the moment that you do kind of, you know, close your eyes and go in, that's when you it could become apparent to you, wow, there's actually something that's been bubbling beneath the surface that someone might not want to address. So it, that could be the moment where the kind of trauma is recognised. Um, and, you know, if it's not in a safely um, supported environment, I think it could be quite risky. Um, yeah, it's... it's, a, it's a, yeah, it is, I'm also worried. I was you know, more kind of advocating for... Or, um, you know, mindfulness in schools and where I was working um, was encouraging mindfulness in schools, but I've become a bit more um, concerned about some potential risks of that now. Um, 
I guess this is sort of a, a, an, an extra part of this question off, off to the side, but uh, Melissa's asking, how do we commun communicate the power of ritual and ceremony to a scientific audience, which I suppose then you need to be able to define when it, it goes you know, into territory that might be uncomfortable territory? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Like, you know, I think that like science kind of, it seems like they do know that there is something to ritual already and but we just call it placebo and there's that's kind of placebo is a dirty word that like well, nothing's you know it's nothing really happened it was just all in the mind but I think um you know creating a meaning response in, in a deliberate way um I think could be really important but I think we we you know I think society at the moment doesn't really want to look at how um heart you know uncomfortable feelings um, can be a good thing. Um, how, you know, by deliberately kind of putting people into discomfort for temporarily might be able to, you know, relieve suffering and, you know, help them process things. Hope that answered the question. Uh, I, even if we don't reach the answers here, this is why um, people can reach you and continue the conversations. Uh, so do uh, connect on social media um, and keep those conversations going and come to Gun States in December. Uh, gunstates.org is the website. Uh, you can buy tickets now. Um, and it's, you know, it's so much easier to have these discussions more in depth uh, when you're together, able to have food together uh, and to, to talk in, in real person together. Uh, Martin had a uh, an add-on uh, to his question earlier about um, meditation versus psychedelics, uh, asking further, could psychedelics be regarded as a way to sustain the benefits of meditation or vice versa? Mm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, like, I, I think so. I think that, you know, just say someone had a, um, a meditation practice for a long time and then, you know, they were practicing regularly, but then they stopped practicing. I think that, you know, yeah, like if they stop practicing for a while and they're kind of out of touch with the kind of skills they had, I think that, you know, by doing psychedelics again could be a way to kind of get them back in touch with those kind of feelings that of those skills that they had developed. But that that's, yeah, that's pretty speculative, I think. Um, yeah, I think I really think a, a lot more research is needed to see if mindfulness meditation practice is a viable kind of bridge to kind of help people um you know following psychedelics and if if that is the kind of best way to kind of or well, integrate i guess it, it ultimately is only going to be one way to kind of integrate psychedelic experiences potentially Uh, if you do have any more questions uh drop them into the youtube chat uh i think we're pretty much uh down to our uh, final questions. Um, there is a, a final question here that I've been uh, told to ask, but we actually already asked that one. So I'm not going to cover that one again. I, I was sort of um, curious about, do, do, you, um, do you think that there, or do you have any concerns that things like mindfulness could be uh, weaponized in a, in a capitalist society? Um, do you have any opinions on that sort of thing? Yeah, I think that, that you know, the critique you've mentioned, Nick, you know that mic mindfulness um yeah i think there's absolutely there's some validity to that and you know the owners and you know people who run businesses putting the responsibility of the mental health onto their workers um i think that is a real problem that, that can be a real problem for sure if they're not doing other things to consider the well-being of the workers then if it's if it's only mindfulness i think that's a problem but at the same time i think that you know mindfulness is a, a really good skill to kind of help you know reduce stress in your life and I think being able to do that is better than not being able to do that I think it's it's better than nothing but um yeah I I think it's a fair critique that some employers only do that and that's not fair yeah it's a uh... It's a sort of it feels like a, a, a tricky world because uh, there's um, sort of this tendency for uh, people who are trying to extract 
profit from you uh, to you use a lot of um, to be tricky, I guess, to to be um, a bit uh, deceptive and purposely deceptive because it's not a, about um, the thing that they're actually saying. It feels very Orwellian. Uh, Jake, thank you very much for your talk tonight and for the uh, Q and A. Uh, Shana says uh, thanks in the uh, in the chat. Remember, you can get in touch uh, with Jake as well. Uh, Jake's uh, details. Uh, Twitter at Jake Payne 92 um, and you can have a chat with him in the uh, YouTube comment section for a, for a moment. Uh, but I think that is uh, just about us for this evening. Um, so yeah. thanks for having go, me. I just thanks. To... thanks, Jake. Oop. There you are. <laughs> Thank you, Jake. Um, Garden States, Friday the 3rd to Sunday the 5th of December 2021, three days of cultivating ethnobotanical plants, knowledge uh, and community. A whole range of uh, speakers there. Uh, here are our plant speakers. Here are some more psychedelic speakers. Um, tickets are on sale now. And as I said before, it's so much uh, easier to have these discussions uh, in person where we can sort of uh, get a feel for each other um, and... Uh, just be a bit human together as well. Um, but thank you very much for uh, being with us on this digital journey as well. Thank you to those who have donated uh, via the uh, EGA website, ntogenesis.org or gunstates.org. Uh, our next webcast is uh, the Woodlover Paralysis. Uh, where is Woodlover Paralysis? Hey, survey results with Simon Beck and Kane Barlow on Wednesday the 28th of July from 8 p.m., same time as usual. And uh, all the all these videos are made available after several weeks on the EGA YouTube channel as well, so you can find those there. Um, and just one final mention as well for the uh, EGA newsletter. That's the place that you want to be signed up to to keep up to date with everything from EGA. Entheogenesis.org uh, forward slash connect is the place to go. And uh, don't forget as well that you can find them on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, and on Twitter. Do, uh, do keep the conversations going there. If you have questions, uh, ask them. Even if it feels like a silly question, ask them. I ask a lot of silly questions. Uh, um, uh, that's, my, that's, well, that's where I get my hats from. Um, thank you very much for being with us tonight on the fifth webcast of the uh, EGA uh, stream. 